and friends, uh, just following on briefly from part one of our uh, brief expose of the Irish Council for Civil Liberties. Um, the, the reason we're doing this, guys, is we're trying to impress on everybody uh, to understand fully and finally that it's all lies. All of it. Almost every institution, every organisation, uh, especially if they're large, um, that are allowed, permitted to function in the state, only do so because they are beholden to the state, no matter what they say on their um, public propaganda. Okay, so just following through on the uh, the part one, if you haven't seen it, guys, go back and look at part one, uh, which very simply explained that we'd been on a webinar with the Irish Council for Civil Liberties and we were blocked ignored and subsequent to that we sent in our public petition which we've been trying to get the Irish government to deal with now for over two years and you can you can get that online guys for about eight euros or so I think it's it's pretty cheap but it's very informative you'll get to understand how this works so having uh, been on that webinar being cut off we followed up with messages we sent off a copy of this document we've given them um, the best part of 10 days now to get back to us. There hasn't been a peep out of them. And then we did a little research online and this is what we discovered. An article by Gary Kavanagh from Gript. Thank you, Gary. I hope you don't mind me quoting from your article, but it's just so appropriate and so apt I have to. Um, quote, for years, the Irish Council for Civil Liberties has claimed to be an entirely independent organisation which does not accept government support or money. A gripped investigation, however, found that between 2011 and 2019, the ICCL received somewhere in the region of two million in public money from the European Union, according to the European Commission's financial transparency system, no less. So that represents over 20% of the ICCL's total income over the period. Only 20%? So we're, these people have, have garnished over 10 million? during that time where's the rest of it come through because of it come from because if you look at their um, declarations on the website we are not scared to speak truth to power yeah um, you can rely on us we're Ireland's le leading civil rights organization etc etc okay anyway uh, to, to carry on the figures given by the FTS do not match those given in the ICCL annual reports in 2019 the FTS listed the ICCL as having received 56,900 of EU funding, but the ICCL annual report for that year only lists a single grant from the EU, 10,000 from the European Commission, and so on. I, I won't use up too much time going through the details here, guys, um, but I'd like to move on to the next part. Uh, the, the point being made here again, guys, they're all liars. They, we've got to get this through our heads, guys. We have been deferring authority and giving away and, and uh, you know, treating these people as if they are wonderful and special, paying them huge funds and monies and listening to their lies all the time. And it's no coincidence that this crisis that we're all wrapped in all around the world at the moment is precisely because there are too many of these diabolicals, these career liars and moral deviants in positions of power and authority. Let me move on. The ICCL has also accepted money from the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. Hold on a minute. Even though the IHREC is an entirely state-funded entity. We'll get back to that in a second, guys. This appears to have begun in 2017 as the closure of Atlantic Philanthropies, which had donated over 12 million to the ICCL, meant the ICCL had to seek alternative funding. Right, guys, who, who's these Atlantic phil philanthropies? They're very closely linked to the Irish Funds, this other organisation, which is the single biggest donor to uh, Irish 
uh, institutions, charities, stuff like that. And you have to say, oh, how, ch how kind of them, how generous. Well, what I'm going to do now, guys, I'm not going to read them all out to you, but I'm just going to pop up as I'm talking on the left here. You'll see lists of the positions of some of the board members of this fund in various countries around the world. Okay. Now, all you need to know is that all of those positions are filled by people in the top of the corporate establishment, uh, global institutions, big pharma, you name it. These people are involved in it, banking, etc., etc. In other words, it's a conglomerate of donors, they call themselves, um, who are giving money to uh, organizations like the Irish Council of Civil Liberties and then the Irish Council for Civil Liberties is claiming that they have no connections whatsoever to the establishment. It's all smoke and mirrors, guys, because I can tell you one thing, that most of the people that head up international corporations, and this has been proven now in scientific studies, are sociopaths, okay, and psychopaths. And sociopaths and psychopaths are not in the business of giving away money. This is a way of peddling influence over so-called uh, independent uh, or, or so-called public bodies, which are anything but. Back to the story. The ICCL has long claimed that its independence from government funding is a nearly unique strength of the ICCL in the Irish non-government organisation space. Muris O'Keji, if I've got her name right, I apologise if I didn't there, the chair of the ICCL's board, Went, to, went so far as to say that the strength of ICCL is our independence. That independence is something we cherish and which we guard and protect. You liar, Muris. And I'll say it again, you liar, Muris. And you know you're a liar, okay? Now, obviously, I'm putting these videos out in public. If you don't like what I'm saying, if anything I'm saying is not true, you know where to find me, okay? It's no secret where we live, and I would welcome any attempt to correct the record. Now, the reason uh, we brought in the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission is, well, first of all, I should tell you that we approached the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission also uh, in respect of our case. Now, first of all, we went to them two or three years ago, giving them a brief of the, uh, the, the dramas that we were involved in and all of the corruption and the lies and the deceptions, all of our rights being violated and quoted their own website straight back to them and just simply said, you know, there, this is an open and shut black and white case for you guys. It's exactly the, the same description that you have for what you do. So when are you going to come and help us? And the uh, Emily Logan at the time was the boss of that agency. And uh, she eventually wrote back a letter when I pushed and pushed them. I got a letter back. It was nonsense. It was total nonsense. It would, it would quote one thing that was the opposite of what they were saying and then say, therefore, we cannot be of any assistance, but thank you for interest in the commission. <clears throat> so I followed through recently and I named the Irish Human Rights Commission as a notice party in my own cases up in the High Court. I won't go into those details now, guys, other than to explain there are cases I've taken against the state for being falsely imprisoned purely because I stood up to corrupt judges. They put me in jail without a proper trial, without having a defense, without any legal representation, etc., etc. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I went back to them and I got this letter. One second, guys. This letter back from them. And you can see, if I hold it up near the camera, you can see the case record numbers at the top there. And it sent back to me uh, from... Una Farrell, higher legal executive. You see her picture here on the left. Uh, why is Una Farrell important? Well, she's working at the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. And as you can see from her LinkedIn profile, um, she's also held uh, other uh, positions embedded with the establishment with uh, high profile law firms and so on. Um, not that that's a crime in itself, but it just goes to show again the incestuous inner circles where all of these people work. Anyway, basically, they wrote back to me in so many words. They said, even though <laughs> me making them a notice party uh, is actually, it's a legal procedure. And once you do it, it's set in stone. They write back to me and they said, oh, we, uh, we, def we decline 
to become a party. They can't decline, but you know what? No one's going to force them to do it. You know, uh, what, the main thing here is that you all get to see who they are and what they're actually doing. All right. But again, back to the Irish Human Rights and Quality Commission. You remember in the first, uh, the first video, we highlighted a Mr. Liam Herrick because it seemed a bit odd that he would be the executive director of the Irish Council for Civil Liberties. Uh, this independent organisation was completely free from government and free from the establishment and isn't scared to speak truth to power, etc., etc. Well, then we find out that, we're, um, that Liam, first of all, used to work as the advisor to President Michael D. Higgins, who is neck deep in all of this rot and corruption himself. Uh, what happens next? Then we find out that Liam was also the executive director of the Irish Penal Reform Trust. And he also is a member, or was a member, of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission and a former board member of other various statutory... So hold on a minute. Why would this be important? Hold on. So it says actually he is a member of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. So hold on a minute. He's a member of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, which is a state sponsored body who are fun channeling monies to the Irish Council of Civil Liberties where Liam is also the chief executive of the, the executive director of the ICCL but just in case you're not getting it guys another little point they make here our work this is the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission is determined independently again by the 15 members of the Commission who were appointed by Head of State President Michael D. Higgins. So here we go and it says the diverse membership of the Commission broadly reflects the nature of Irish society. No it doesn't. Liars. Again. Liars. No it doesn't. It reflects the insider incestuous corrupt elites that um, are embedded in the cabal. Right? That's what it does. Anyway guys We'll, leave, we'll push that aside for the time being. I think the point has been proven. The Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission is not what it says it is. And we need to start understanding this in context of the bigger picture. And the bigger picture we'll get to in a moment, guys. But I now want to fly through, literally, about a minute on each one of these topics now, so as to keep this video nice and short. Okay. Uh, number two. The, a quick update, guys, on the situation with the... Uh, the, the young lady who had gone to Mayo General Hospital, uh, she had, uh, against the wishes of herself and her family, the hospital moved to sedate her and force her onto a ventilator. Um, I, I'm very happy to say that the young lady is back at home with her family at the moment. They're still watching her. She's under a certain amount of care, but the, uh, the family believe that our action in going into the hospital and forcing them to accept a power of attorney, in other words, that her elder sister had the right to make all decisions about her health care so that the hospital couldn't go ahead and follow protocols, which are in effect, and I, again, I want to be careful, I don't want to get uh, removed and censored unnecessarily, but protocols that do not seem to be operating in the best interests of the patients. Please research it and you'll understand what I'm talking about. So anyway, we'll give you another update on that uh, <clears throat> when we hear more. But I do briefly want to say one thing about Pro-justice activists, guys. There's a lot of us out there in various different groups and associations, um, small clusters, individuals, and so on. I just want to make one point most respectfully and ask everybody please to understand this, okay? We're doing nobody any good by pointing at other organizations, other individuals, when they make mistakes or errors, or even when they don't, when they do something different to what perhaps we think they should be doing. It's not helping, guys. There's enough, there, there's enough difficulties as it is going up against this corrupt cabal, this establishment, without people denigrating each other behind the scenes. And I'm just putting the appeal out. Of course, I'm not, of course, mentioning any names here. I'm asking everybody out there who is involved in trying to defend our fundamental rights, trying to defend the futures of our children and such like, trying to look after the, the vulnerable in society when they're being let down so abysmally by uh, the so-called institutions of the state. Um, Please, if you haven't got something to say, something good to say about uh, other pro just activists, please keep it to yourself or deal with the matter in private. Okay, guys, now I hope I'm not overstepping my own uh, position here. It's a genuine call 
for unity of mind, even if it's not always going to be unity of plans and unity of direction. But please, the unity of minds, in as much as we are fighting a thoroughly wicked and corrupted establishment, and we need to uh, need to make sure that anybody who is trying to do something about it uh, is encouraged and supported as much as possible. Okay, number three. Yes, <clears throat> you might be surprised to hear that um, about a week ago, 10 days ago, I got an invitation to go back up to Casabar Courthouse at the end of the month. Now, if we go, it will be on the 29th. There will be more on this to come. But I, I wrote back to them and I said, um, I will come conditionally. In other words, I will tell you the terms under which I'm going to come because there's been so much criminality foisted on me and my friends, my family, my colleagues when we go into these courts, um, you know, being assaulted by guards, being lied to, being set up and framed, uh, having um, <clears throat> obnoxious judges uh, doing everything from threatening to throw us in jail to actually throwing us in jail. And all of this, of course, is criminal activity. And I cannot and will not be party to that. So I made it clear what you should understand, guys. This is ostensibly to advance. I'm sorry, I've got a bit of a throat today to advance my uh, common informer prosecutions against a judge, a Garda inspector and a court service manager for deliberately and knowingly violating um, high court orders on eight occasions in a row. Those of you that are following the story will know that I took the matter to the high court uh, in May and again the whole system just buckled in on itself. Judges lying, uh, calling hearings, uh, the court service staff disappearing my documents, me turning up with a group of people going in you know, um, a, a protection detail going into the courts, the judge running out, um, making a complete shambolic disgrace of himself, Judge Michael McGrath that was. And then finally, he called a hearing and invited the Irish Times to it without telling me it was happening, even though it was my judicial review case. And <clears throat> ostensibly that case has been shut down, but it hasn't, of course, because fraud vitiates everything. When they commit criminal offences, they have no jurisdiction, guys, okay? And we've got Integrity Ireland asseverations to that effect already up there, and you can use them anytime you want. Next item. Yes, guys, now you remember uh, the, two videos back was a letter to Stephen Donnelly, the Irish Minister for Health. Now, it wasn't just a letter, it was a notice, it was a declaration. It was telling not only Stephen Donnelly, but Dr. Holohan and the whole of the Neffet people, the crowd that are advising our government, um, that the, uh, we had all the evidence now to explain to them in black and white details, all the data, the graphs, the you know, and scientific reports, everything, that much that is happening at the moment in this so-called crisis is actually unlawful and the reason it's unlawful is because it's based on a clause in Irish legislation that basically says in so many words that because of the grave and terrible danger posed to everybody by you know what then we have to do this so we've written it and explained to them well actually there is no alarming um, immediate grave danger um, so some of these measures that have been foisted on the Irish people can no longer be qualified or justified or, auth or authenticated. And we asked all of the TDs, that's all of our parliament members, the team, the Neffet team, about 40 of them, I think, and uh, Stephen Donnelly. We put them on notice and we said, in seven days or so, if we haven't heard back from you, we are issuing a lawful declaration that anybody who facilitates or complies with these measures is in fact committing an unlawful activity, all right? Now, there'll be more on this in due course, guys. Just get your minds around this. It's very simple in one way. If you can establish, <clears throat> excuse me, that a crime is being committed, all right? For instance, you're with a group of people and you're, you're one of five people, let's say, and the four of them say, we're going to go into the shop and rob it. If you know that that's about to happen and you still go in there with them, you're complicit. You can be held uh, accountable and liable as well. So that's the point where you say, sorry guys, if that's what you want to do, you go, you go ahead. I can't do it because I'd be committing a crime. So it's along those lines we're thinking at the moment, guys. I've been to two or three different meetings now. There's a couple more coming up in the coming uh, weeks. Uh, a lot of people getting together, starting, starting to think along similar lines. And again, we'll give you more details when the time is right. But I'll just finish with this little pointer that everybody should know. All of our news about the crisis, when we go back to the government and they're talking on camera, 
they keep on telling us that oh we have to follow Neffet advice all right so this is the national emergency health team okay we have to follow their advice so i started looking it up and said well who's giving Neffet advice and they thought oh it's the world health organization oh okay the world health organization all right who's giving the world health organization their advice oh it's this body called the world health assembly hmm so who are the world health assembly Oh, they're, uh, they're comprised of ministers from member states of the World Health Organization. When you say ministers, you mean health ministers from the individual countries. Yeah, that's right. Well, hold on. So you've got health ministers from the individual countries in the World Health Association telling the World Health Organization what they want them to tell NEFET to tell our governments to do. As I said before, guys, it's all lies. Lies and deceptions. Now, uh, I'll come to my book again in a moment, guys. I'll just flash it up here on the left. This book explains it all, all of this, okay? How human society has evolved, how organizations are structured uh, in a way that we could only but call them diabolical, all right? In the literal biblical meaning of the term. Most human organizations, once they get to a certain size, cannot help but become corrupted. They don't have a conscience like a human uh, individual does. Therefore, they do not and cannot answer to, let's say, the soul, the spirit, or the eternal divine. In other words, morality is gone. And that's how we see much that's happening today is happening because it's, it's on the backs of these large organizations that are populated at the top by sociopaths and psychopaths. And we've really got to start thinking about what we're going to do to solve this problem. Yes, um, also on the 26th, Tuesday the 26th of this month, at 12 o'clock, outside the Standards and um, Public Office Commission, uh, Standards for Public Office Commission, uh, at Earls Fort Terrace, St. Peter's, Dublin 2. Okay, now, these are the people who look after all of the criteria and the paperwork to do with elections. The long and the short of it is this, guys. They appear to be going out of their way to pick on uh, the independent candidates, several of whom ran in the last election, including myself, although I'd like to quickly put in a caveat that uh, my main reason for running is to put a spotlight on the anti-corruption. At least the newspapers have to cover some of what you say, and at least sometimes you, you can get on the radio and stuff. It's well worth um, the, the opportunity you know, to get the word out. But um, SIPO appear to be targeting, now I say appear to be targeting, a lot of these candidates um, and trying to make life uh, hell for them using official channels, you know, just basically harassment. And a group of us are going to get together and explain to those who want to come along and listen in support what is wrong with another state organization that's supposed to be working in your interests, but is doing anything but. And I'd like to add here, guys, that in, in the last election, 56% of my vote went missing between the first tally and the, the actual count, the, the, the first count. Uh, Finton Murphy is the county registrar here in County Mayo, um, epitomizes everything that is wrong uh, and corrupt with our establishment. And yes, Mr. Murphy, I'm waiting for your notice of uh, liability or slander. You know and I know that's never coming my way because I've got all the proofs and the last thing you want is to give me a platform to tell more people about it. Isn't that right? Yeah. So I did report that to the guards. That's been buried. I reported it to the houses of the Oroctus. You'd think at least they in a democratic society like Ireland would be concerned that um, um, an independent candidate could lose 50% of his votes, literally disappeared off the charts from the initial tally, not our tally by the way, the other political parties tally, uh, and then by the time the first count came, they'd all gone. And I wouldn't mind, but I'd warn Mr. Murphy in advance that if it happened again, because it's the second time it happened, that he'd be held liable. Anyway, that's on the Tuesday the 26th, guys, at 12 o'clock. If you can make it, we'll be going up there. And, um, yeah, we'll have a few books and stuff available as well, those of you that are interested. And finally, guys, um, a quick shout-out about the book again. Here it is on the left. Um, Crisis, Cull or Coup? What, How and Who? Facts and Truths to Make You Think. Uh, it, uh, it was up on th number three on Amazon, which is um, great credit to those of you who have gone out there and bought it. Uh, could I ask those of you, uh, when you purchase a copy, would you mind please going back 
onto the platform that you bought it. And there's two or three different options there. There's an independent bookshop in England that's selling them as well. Um, the, part of the reason for this is because uh, for reasons that are, well, we can, we can guess of what the reasons are, but Amazon has the book listed as unavailable or out of stock or you can get it in two weeks. It's all nonsense, guys. You put your credit card details in, the book is getting printed and sent to you. It's called print on demand technology. That's how it works. Your credit card details go in, the information goes out, the book is printed, dispatched and sent to you. It's all automatic. So please don't be shy. Don't be put off if you want to read it. And the reason again, guys, um, um, please understand, I, I'm not plugging this book for sales. That's not the idea here, guys. This book took months to write. It's a culmination of about 25 years of studies that I've done in sociology, psychology, theology, and international uh, management. Now, uh, the latter, mind you, I dropped that course when I realized that basically those people who are training for international management, um, the degree, a, a, large, a large portion of it, was teaching people how to facilitate, uh, manipulate, um, work around or with the corruption that we find in the different countries around the world. Uh, I was very disappointed to find that, but it was one of the trigger points that got me thinking, well, why is it that are we conditioned and trained all our lives to, you know, go to school, leave school, go to college, get a degree, get a good job with a re reputable organization and slowly work our way up the ladder to the, you know, to have a you know, successful life. But is it successful, guys, if you have to sell your soul? And I'm not saying that you go and have a deal with the devil in some dark cavern with naked babes dancing all around you and all the rest of it. No, 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 no. It comes in increments, small little snippets. Before you know it, it's like the frog being boiled in water. You put it in cold water and then you slowly turn up the heat. And before he knows it, his goose is cooked, so to speak. The same thing is happening to us guys. Many of us are slowly giving away our moral authority, our integrity. We're slowly, bit by bit, selling our souls, trading it off for the tricks of the trade and for the riches of the kingdoms of this world. And those of you that know your Bible will know what I'm talking about. Anyway, guys, I'll wrap it up there. From here on in, guys, I'm going to do my best to keep all videos to about 10 minutes or less. I've got a timer. I'm going to start using it on the next one um, so that I hopefully hold your, in your interest. And we'll be talking more and more about the book, guys. Please get it because what I do explain in the book, guys, it's, it's a, a way of thinking that most of us it would be alien to most of us. And again, I hope I don't sound too presumptuous here. But I, I truly believe that the people who read the book will start seeing life differently. You'll start seeing life in uh, perspective, in the perspective of universal law. I can't go into it right now, but I intend to do some short videos about each of the chapters and maybe put them up uh, on the Integrity Ireland website or the bookstore uh, where people can, you know, click on the videos, short videos, uh, covering each chapter to get people an idea of what the book is really about. But it literally walks us through human history from point A, from the mythical biblical point A, the Garden of Eden, from our historical point A, the scientific point A, the Big Bang, and from the ancient Neanderthal tribes and everything, straight through to the common day. It's not, I don't overcook it, I don't think. It's written in plain language for everyone to understand before then we tackle the crisis that we're all in at the moment in context of that history, and then it starts to make sense. And then I would hope that people who read the book will start agreeing with me. Aha, we have to start thinking differently. And point number one is stop giving away our authority to the diabolicals. And there are suggestions in the book of how to do that as well. Okay, guys, thanks again for listening, everybody. Um, please watch this space and uh, support us as much as you can. Watch out for the declaration that's going to come out, which will basically everybody in the country will be able to download this thing. It'll be a one page or no more. Um, it'll make reference to other materials, but they'll just be online for anyone who wants to go and look at them. But it'll be a one page document. You will be able to print it out, carry it on you, and it will be in effect a lawful or legal pass to prevent you from having to comply with unlawful. Now, please listen carefully. I'm saying unlawful diktats and orders coming from people who are deceiving us 
uh, royally deceiving us okay now we'll explain more when it's ready I'll do a full video on that less than 10 minutes and uh, I, I expect that's going to happen maybe in about two or three days time all right so please watch out for this because I notice also as well that uh, Mr. Martin and Neffert have been making some noises about oh making some big changes now I can't say this for sure but I would imagine that us sending the declaration into them uh, last week may just have had something to do with it. Thanks again for listening, guys. Please keep uh, supporting us and uh, respecting each other. Thank you.